you, David. So I'm Evdokia Nikolov at UT Austin, and uh, the bulk of what I'll present is joint work with uh, two great collaborators, Richard Cole at NYU and my former postdoc at UT Austin, Thanasis Leoneas, who is now at the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, and this work was motivated by uh, transportation and the heavy road traffic congestion that probably most of us sitting in this room and watching perhaps have experienced. And we wanted to understand to what extent um, diversity of user preferences in terms of what routes we pick might help alleviate traffic congestion. So what is traffic congestion? is the phenomenon that a lot of users end up using the same route or the same link, the same set of resources. And as a result, uh, those routes or parts of routes become heavily congested and everyone ends up experiencing higher travel time than they would if there was no one else on, on the route except for them. Um, and the intuition is that if we all have diverse preferences on our routing choices, for example, some people may prefer uh, longer routes but with no tolls or um, maybe paying a lot of money just to have the fastest route and so on, that maybe um, the traffic in the traffic of equilibrium in the resulting traffic assignment, people would kind of spread out more so there would be each individual route or link would be less, less congested and therefore everyone would experience better uh, overall tra uh, travel time. Um, so how exactly do we model uh, diversity of user preferences or heterogeneity? So two examples uh, came to mind. We came from it uh, thinking from the point of view of risk averse uh, uh, user preferences. So uh, many of you who commute here in the Bay Area might be familiar with those uh, routing times. So if you were to come from Palo Alto to uh, uh, the workshop today, uh, depending on when you uh, Googled uh, or when you searched for your optimal route, you might have very diverse travel time estimates. Um, this is something that I did at noon, so it's not peak hour traffic, and the estimate was one hour for the commute. Uh, and in rush hour, uh, 4 p.m., I think that first snapshot, it could go up to one hour and a half. Um, but we cannot even rely on those estimates because uh, what they failed to take into account was, is the evolving uh, uh, traffic congestion. So, for example, it happened to me already uh, in the majority of times I went to uh, uh, Palo Alto and back, uh, it happened to me that I was given an estimate of one hour for my commute, but by the time I got to Berkeley, it actually had been one hour and a half. And so uh, diversity in this situation may arise from how users trade off the uh, mean and variance, so the expected travel time, the experience, and the variability. Um, and maybe if you're just going to work, uh, if you happen to leave one place and go to the other and you do that routinely, you maybe are sort of risk uh, neutral, care about your average on a daily basis, but if you're going to the airport, you're extremely risk averse and then uh, you'll trade off mean and variance in a very different way. You'll have a much heavier weight on, on the variance. Another way to um, capture diverse user preferences, as I mentioned, is how uh, users react to tolls. So some people hate tolls, do not want to pay them and will do anything to avoid them. And others have very high value for their time and therefore they're willing to pay money to save time. And so again, diversity may arise in how people trade off uh, uh, money and uh, uh, time, travel time and, and money spent on tolls. Um, so as a, a preview of our result, we, we thought, as I said intuitively, that having diverse preferences um, would help uh, alleviate traffic congestion and result with smaller equilibrium costs. Uh, and I'll define uh, this later. To our surprise, diversity didn't seem to help in many situations, so in particular, as a preview of our results, we arrived at a, a characterization in which we uh, uh, established that diversity helps when everyone has the same source and destination. Diversity uh, always, always helps only if the network is series parallel. And if the network is not series parallel, 
It doesn't necessarily help, and you can uh, come up with examples where actually diversity hurts, meaning you end up with a higher overall total travel time. And if uh, we allow multiple sources and destinations, then diversity helps if and only if the network, again, is of a particular type, which we introduce here and we call block matching. And I'll define and explain what that is later. And again, if it is not of that type, you can come up with examples where diversity hurts. So uh, uh, that's a preview, and let me go into the formal model. So we have a directed graph with a G with a set of nodes, V, a set of edges, E. And we have, in the general uh, model, multiple source destination pairs. I call them SK and TK. Uh, and I say that there is demand DK between the K source destination pair. Think of that as that many users need to route between this particular source destination pair. Uh, and sometimes this is also called commodity K. So commodity K is simply the people that need to route from uh, the K source to the K destination. Um, and we consider users being infinitesimally small. So in the jargon of this literature, this is called non-atomic players. Uh, simply, it means that you can think of all players as a flow. And uh, this flow needs to choose feasible paths between their corresponding source and destination. So the player's decisions, at the end of the day, can be encapsulated by a flow vector. And this flow vector can be thought of as either a vector on all the paths or a vector on all the edges. If it's a vector on all the paths, we have a coordinate for each path, which tells us how many users or how much flow pick that particular path. And I'll abuse notation and use the same letter for uh, a corresponding edge flow representation, which tells me for a given edge in the network how many users use that particular edge. And like I said, we want to capture diversity. So uh, we assume here that uh, users who need to select routes care about two criteria. One criterion I will call edge delay. I'll denote, denote it by the function LE of X. So it's a function on how many users choose that edge, uh, XE. And because I want to reserve cost for the, co the overall cost of a path that the user experiences, I'll instead call the second criterion deviation, just for the sake of uh, using some word that we can relate to. This deviation could be thought of as variance, or it could be thought of as the toll, uh, or whatever the second criterion happens to be. And uh, I'll just use sigma e of xe for the deviation. So again, these are two criteria that users care about. Again, you can think of them as travel time and uh, tolls, money converted to time units. Or you can think of this, for example, as average travel time and something capturing the variance. Um, and they're both functions of the traffic on that edge, XC, or the number of users on that edge. And so uh, different players trade off these two criteria in a different way. And we capture this uh, via this, what we call a diversity parameter R. So a player who has diversity parameter R cares to minimize their uh, first criterion plus R times the second criterion. And the convenience of this linear trade-off between the two is that it ends up being nicely separable into sum over edges. So for each edge, the user cares to minimize the first criterion plus r times the second criterion. And then summing over the edges will give them the cost they experience for a given path. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me, since I'll be talking about the, uh, the cost of equilibria, and I want to compare the cost of equilibria for heterogeneous users versus homogeneous ones. Um, there is some thought that needs to go into how we define this cost. So again, the cost of a path is straightforward. Uh, my, the, path, uh, the cost of uh, some given path is just the, this linear combination of the two criteria traded off with the diversity parameter R. But what should be the cost of equilibrium, or in general, the cost of any flow, any traffic assignment in the network? There are two possibilities. One possibility is that the cost of a flow should be the total first criterion only. 
So in the example of tolls, if people trade off between toll, uh, travel time and money paid for tolls, the cost of a flow I'm saying here is just the travel time. So tolls do not participate in the cost of the flow. And this is consistent with the vast, uh, uh, with the vast uh, majority of uh, literature on tolls. Um, uh, this is just a uh, standard, and uh, uh, there are different rationales given for that, for why the money should not participate in the cost of flow. Um, in the risk-averse routing application, you can think of that as the cost being only the total average travel time, not the variance, because from the point of view of a central planner who cares about long-term averages and making the system efficient in terms of long-term averages, they only care about the total average travel time that users experience. The second natural criterion is the notion of social welfare from economics, which is to sum up all the users' utilities or costs that they experience and call this the cost of our flow. So in this case, it would be the total over all the users of both the first and the second criterion. Or in other words, the total summation of the cost of paths that different users experience. And I want to point out here is that none of them is wrong or right. They are just both applicable in different situations depending on your goal. Uh, and um, there are two natural questions that result um, now that we have this uh, different parameter R. Um, one question is you could ask how does the equilibrium cost, and again I'll define equilibrium cost a little later, but how does the equilibrium cost of a population with parameter R compare to the equilibrium cost of a population with parameter zero? So in the setting with risk aversion, for example, this is comparing how much more risk averse users travel compared to risk neutral users. Another question is the question of diversity here. How does the equilibrium cost of a diverse uh, population where diversity is captured by a distribution of possible parameters R, how does that compare to a corresponding homogeneous population where the homogeneous population has some, uh, an average parameter R, the average taken over the distribution? So we studied both of these questions uh, separately for the, and we studied them with the different uh, cost of flow definitions. So for the first question, we studied that for flow cost defined as the first criterion only. And this is the definition for, for this question. This is the definition that's more sensible so as to have a common benchmark properly comparing populations with parameter R to zero. Um, and for the second question, we answer that for cost equal to total user costs. So summing up all the path costs that people experience and calling that the cost of our solution. Yeah. Um, are these functions L and sigma linear? No, these are arbitrary. Because what I was thinking is, if you give me the entire path, I will take the entire path and apply function on it. I won't go edge by edge. If I give you the entire path, uh, you want to apply these functions for the entire path. Now, the thing is that you, you need to apply it for every edge individually, simply because the flow amount on each edge may be different. Right? And so maybe the first part of your route is there is nobody else on that road. It's the inside roads that take you to the highway. Nobody else is in your neighborhood. The second part is on the highway, heavy congestion traffic. So you, you do want to apply those functions on every edge. But now the question how you, how you total them together to give you the entire path cost may give rise to different definitions. So here I'm using linear, just adding up the costs over the edges. But you may say, oh, if I have something else, maybe it should be nonlinear. So if I care about standard deviation, it would be you know, square root of the sum of squares over the edges. So uh, in that sense, yeah, there are multiple definitions here. I consider the linear case. Was that the answer your question? Um, and uh, I'll... Before I go on, let me again, uh, let me define equilibrium formally. So it's uh, um, really the simple notion that everyone routes along least cost paths. If there is a path that is of smaller cost than what I currently have, I will prefer to switch so that would not be equilibrium. 
And formally, this is defined as a flow x, such that whenever a path is used, its cost should be no greater than that of any alternative path. Again, a mathematical way of saying that every user uses least cost paths, given the current traffic. And uh, we call this a heterogeneous equilibrium if there are different player types with different Rs, different diversity parameters. And I'll reserve the letter G for the heterogeneous equilibrium. And we call it a homogeneous equilibrium. And again, I'll use just for notation, I'll use a different letter F just to make them distinct, if everyone has the same diversity parameter R. So uh, to come back to those questions, I'll mention a few words about this first question. So I gave a, a longer talk on that in the previous workshop. Uh, but just to put it in context with the other one, I'll mention a few words and then I'll, I'll go back to comparing diverse um, uh, equilibrium costs with uh, homogeneous ones. Uh, so how would we compare uh, the equilibrium cost of a population with parameter R to uh, one with parameter zero? So again, we answer this for the case when the flow cost is the uh, first criterion only. And again, our motivation at the time, we came from thinking about risk averse users. And so we thought, well, it makes sense, again, if uh, uh, a central planner only cares about the total, the sum of expected travel times. Um, and again, since we were thinking about risk averse users, we called this uh, ratio of the two equilibria price of risk aversion. Uh, but subsequently, so this is the inefficiency introduced by users that care for the second criterion in addition to the, uh, to the first one. Uh, but subsequently, our work was generalized by um, uh, Peter Clare and Guido Schaeffer, who called this ratio uh, the deviation ratio. And that's perhaps more precise because it doesn't just apply about, uh, uh, to risk aversion, but also tolls and um, general situations when we have two criteria. So price of risk aversion or deviation ratio, same thing, essentially is the ratio that compares the worst case cost of a, of a homogeneous equilibrium when everyone has parameter R to a homogeneous equilibrium when everyone has, oh, and this is a typo, when everyone has parameter zero. And so again, in the, in the setting of risk aversion, this is comparing a equilibrium resulting from risk averse users compared to risk neutral users. In the case of tolls, this is people who care about tolls, so they don't like tolls, versus those who don't care about any money and just care about travel time. So why do you call it a risk aversion? Why do I call it risk aversion? So why does, I'm just trying to understand. You mean this, this name here or the so choice? So from, from my motivation at the beginning when I said travel time is variable and some people may trade off mean and, and variance. But you're adding up the, the second criterion, you're adding it up over the ages. You just, mm -hmm. so, so what is an example? Are your, your, I, I use, a risk measure which it is the uh, that, that's, risk that's an excellent, the yeah, that's an excellent question and it could actually result in a long discussion. So I'm, I'm going to say maybe two words now and defer it to a longer discussion uh, at the end or in the break. Uh, there are many ways to model risk aversion. And you're right that in general, risk aversion is something that's like we saw in the previous talk that should be nonlinear as opposed to linear if you think about expected utility theory. And here I'm saying these things are linear. So here our model for risk aversion is um, trading off mean and variance. So I'm calling somebody a risk averse user if they want to minimize the mean plus R times variance of their route. And assuming independent travel time distributions, the variance of a route is the sum of variances over the edges. And so in that sense, it is linear. Now you may say, oh, it doesn't make sense. Mean and variance are not measured in the same units, which is true. Uh, mean and standard deviation is more meaningful, but standard deviation because of the square root is really complicated. And we've tried to analyze, that's one of the open questions. We've tried to analyze this, but we just haven't been able to. 
uh, but also because in practice people want to implement these things, they struggle with the same. As standard deviation being nonlinear, there are heuristics where instead of taking the correct standard deviation of a path, people just add up standard deviations of the edges. And so again, in that sense, it's linear, it's a heuristic. And, and so in that sense, it is, it is linear here. And I say that because users incorporate both mean and variance in their objective function, I call those risk averse, as opposed to those that have only average travel time, and I call those risk neutral. Does that make sense? But in general, you're right, risk aversion comes with maybe some nonlinearity that should be embedded in the definition. There are other, there are other um, concerns that when you go to a dynamic situation, real-time decision-making has to do with things evolving over time. A time-consistent risk-averse measure has been defined as one, so someone studied in the context of transportation, they said a time-consistent one can only be one that's linear, that's additive. Otherwise, it won't be time consistent. But again, I'll, I'll close here. There is a huge, there's a huge modeling question with many, uh, with many possible ideas. Yeah. Um, so I don't understand why it's necessary that risk aversion introduces inefficiency always. That's a great question. The question is why does risk aversion introduce inefficiency? We don't say that it does. We just say that when it does, how much more will it be? So it's true that sometimes things may get worse and sometimes things may, be, may get better. Would it be meaningful to ask for the inf here as well and see in what It would be. It would be. And uh, we haven't studied it, so that's another open question. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, and so, so, yeah, again, it, it doesn't have to be that the equilibrium with parameter r is more costly. It's just that sometimes it is, and we want to understand in the worst case how much more costly is it. Uh, and actually one, um, I'm taking a detour here, but one way to tackle traffic congestion is to introduce tolls. And you can think of tolls, in this case precisely they're the second criterion. If you implement the correct tolls, they will take you to the socially optimal traffic assignment. And so in that case, it is better. So in that sense, you can maybe think that it's been studied, yeah, because the best is attaining the social optimum. But if you don't introduce the right tolls, then you may mess things up so much so that you actually end up paying a much heavier cost in the resulting traffic assignment than without any tolls. So you can think of it maybe as a policy question as well. And so, I'll, again, I'll just briefly say what the result was. So this deviation ratio or price of risk aversion as we originally called it. The main result is that it scales linearly with the size of the network. In particular, we, we showed that it depends on these parameters, eta, r, k, where r is our diversity parameter. Eta is a parameter that captures the topology of the network. So it's something which is one for simple parallel networks. It's also one for series parallel graphs. Um, it becomes two for the simplest non-series parallel graph, the brace network. And in the worst case, it can be as big as the number of nodes over two. And uh, uh, this k is the maximum ratio of the second criterion over the first one at equilibrium. And this bound is tight, so we have a matching lower bound. And uh, as a very brief intuition, um, how this bound is shown, we show that there must exist an alternating path. This is a path of a sequence of forward and backward edges in our directed network. And this eta, is the number of alternations, how many times you switch from forward to backward. And what we show specifically is that such an alternating path exists for which the forward edges carry higher risk neutral flow, whereas the backward ones carry higher risk averse flow. And in that way, we are able to compare the risk averse equilibrium cost to the cost of this path and then the cost of this path to the risk neutral one and obtain the bound. 
And some people, when when they uh, uh, who are used to seeing a price of anarchy, something I haven't defined here, but I'll just uh, state it for those who who are aware, price of energy we think of as typically constant. So there is the famous price of energy result, price of energy for general networks is 4 over 3. Um, in uh, general networks, if we have linear delay functions, but again, that constant is he heavily dependent on an assumption on what your latency functions can be, whereas this is a different type of bound which is independent, so this works for general uh, latency and deviation functions, whereas if we take the alternative approach of bounding the class of latency functions, we actually get something comparable to those price of energy results. We get that the price of risk aversion or deviation ratio, uh, as you wish, is at most the corresponding price of energy times a slightly inflated factor to account for the additional uh, diversity and uh, the trade-off of the second to the first criterion. So anyway, that's, that's all I'll say about this. Um, and I want to come back to the question of diversity. So how does the equilibrium cost of uh, a heterogeneous population compare to one of a corresponding homogeneous population? And let me come back again to the costs of those equilibria. Uh, we compare the heterogeneous um, equilibrium to a corresponding homogeneous one where the diversity parameter is the average of the distribution that we observe in the heterogeneous case. And specifically, the average is simply, for a single commodity, is simply the weighted average. This is, remember, how many users uh, are well, this is how many users are of type I who, who have diversity parameter Ri. And this is the weighted average. So the average parameter is the weighted average of those um, uh, diversity parameters. And the equivalent uh, definition follows for a continuous distribution of uh, diverse population. And uh, um, here D is my total demand for all players of a given type. So again, for a single commodity, my heterogeneous equilibrium is adding up all the player costs, all the user costs. So remember that a user with diversity parameter Ri, so I here is a subscript, should be a subscript, experiences that cost of the path they choose. And so those that many users experience that cost and adding up over all the users gives me the, the total heterogeneous cost. G. And again, uh, to, to further highlight the difference between heterogeneous and homogeneous, I also add the superscripts heterogeneous and homogeneous just to remind me what I'm talking about. For a homogeneous equilibrium, everyone has the same average diversity parameter R, and therefore everyone will experience the same path cost because routing from the same source to the same destination, if you have a choice of multiple paths, if two are not equal, you'll switch to the cheaper one. So in equilibrium, all the paths that are used have the same cost, given by some cost here, and we multiply by the total demand. And for multi-commodity, you um, I didn't want to put it here to not have the extra notation, you just take the sum over uh, the multiple commodities. And so to, again, uh, I gave you a preview of our results at the beginning, which were talking about different network structures. So let me uh, explain briefly what these different network structures are. Uh, so for the single commodity case, the result was that diversity helps if and only if the graph is series parallel. So what's a series parallel graph? Something that looks like that and not something that looks like that. So uh, there are multiple definitions. One that is commonly given is an inductive definition, which says that the simplest series parallel network is um, a single edge. And we can obtain all possible series parallel networks either by replacing an edge by two edges in parallel or by two edges in series. And so if, if we continue this process on and on, we are going to reach a whole, a whole family of series parallel networks, of which this one is one such example. And uh, something that results from this 
definition is that we can represent series parallel networks in terms of their block representation. So what do I mean by that? Series parallel networks might be a single block, such as this one, or multiple blocks by a block. I mean, so uh, since I connect sometimes things in, in series, a series parallel network uh, may look like this, where individual blocks cannot be represented as a two networks in series. That's all, yeah. Your example shows one of direct, having directed edges, is that is so, it both undirected? Uh, so I'm talking about, uh, you're correct. So series parallel in general can be defined for undirected and directed. For my talk, I'm using directed. But here, I've, yeah, I've just draw, happened to draw undirected situations. Uh, but yeah, imagine all those links directed pointing forward. And so here, just because uh, I was lazy, just went to make multiple copies to make uh, a block representation of a series network, parallel network with three blocks. This one is a series parallel network with one block, but you can imagine a series parallel network with multiple blocks. And so I'll be calling them, this is the S, the beginning, V1, V2, and so on will be my intermediary nodes. Think of those as the bridges that you have to go through single points all the way to the destination. So this is the block representation of a series parallel network. And for the multi-commodity result, the characterization is in terms of what I call uh, block matching networks. So those are networks which, so a series parallel network only is meaningful for a single origin and destination. If we have multiple origins and destinations, think of interweaving multiple series parallel networks between those corresponding sources and destinations. And here is an example where I have two source destination pairs, S1, T1, and S2, T2. All the simple paths from S1 to T1 are uh, captured by a series parallel network given in red here. And this red network has four blocks, A, B, C, and D. All simple paths from S2 to T2 are captured via six blocks, or, or five, however many, let's see. E, D, F, which is a single edge, B, C, and G. And so we called such an interweaving of series parallel graphs block matching whenever two blocks from two different commodities either entirely coincide or they do not share any edges. Yeah. Uh, series parallel numbers are always planar or no? Mm, uh, let me think quickly. Uh, series parallel, are they always planar? Does someone <laughs> in the audience have a quick answer to that? Yes? Okay, I'll take that as a answer. <laughs> I, I blanked out. <laughs> okay, yes. And so you, you see here that those two uh, commodities, the green one and the red one, share two blocks in common, block B and block D. So block B and block D are entirely the same, and all the other blocks are entirely disjoint, meaning they can... They might share the same node, but they have no edges in common. Okay. Um, so, here is, which way did I go? So, like I said, the, our result is that for a single commodity, when everyone has the same source and destination, diversity always helps if and only if the network is series parallel. And so we prove that in two stages, it's a if and only if, so we go in one direction and the other. So starting with if we have a series parallel network, then diversity always helps, regardless of the choice of uh, delay and deviation functions. How do we prove something like that? The key lemma is that there exists a path in the network which is used by the homogeneous flow, 
which has lower heterogeneous cost. And this is not always true. So this is only true for series parallel networks. And the way to prove this lemma is by induction on the series parallel structure of the graph. And once we have this lemma, the main result follows just following the definition of equilibrium costs. So I said the equilibrium cost for the heterogeneous equilibrium is the total sum over all the uh, costs of heterogeneous agents. Uh, they are uh, using lowest cost paths, and so they're upper bounded by some this fixed path P. And uh, then I use the lemma to transition from the heterogeneous flow to the homogeneous flow. And finally, I get the homogeneous equilibrium cost. In the opposite direction, if we do not have a series parallel network, the simplest such network is a network of this form, sometimes called the brace graph. We come up with specific delay and deviation functions for which uh, diversity hurts. So we have higher uh, cost of the uh, heterogeneous equilibrium. And to show that for any non-series parallel graph, again, diversity may hurt, is we embed this network in the general non-series parallel network. And sometimes uh, one definition or one characterization of series parallel graphs are graphs that do not, do not contain this subgraph as a, uh, as a subgraph, as a minor. And so again, we embed this and we get the result for, for general non-series parallel networks. And so that's the if and only for, for single source and destination. For multiple source and destination, Again, if we start with a block matching network, this direction is easy from the single commodity because we show that a single commodity, when we restrict the network to that single commodity, that's a series parallel network. Therefore, diversity helps. And summing up over all the commodities, we get that diversity helps always for such block matching networks. And the real tough part is to show it in the opposite way, to show that block matching networks are actually necessary for diversity to hurt. And we do that again by constructing a small example on which diversity hurts. In this case, it's a two commodity example with only three paths. The first one going from S1 to T1, the second going from S2 to T2. There is a single path from S2 to T2, while there are two possible routes from S1 to T1. And here, there are only two edges for which we assign non-negative. Uh, delay and deviation functions, all the others have zero. So it's those two edges that determine how the flow will go. And what happens is that we can assign such functions such that in the homogeneous case, all users will use the top. So the bottom will not be congested and the overall, oh maybe I, did I say that wrong? I'll, uh, I'll not confuse myself and you at this point, but basically you can come up with delay and deviation functions for those two edges, such that um, diversity will hurt. Uh, the homogeneous uh, flow will be lower. Okay. And now how to do that in uh, how to prove the general theorem? I'll just mention, I'll spend maybe two minutes on the flow of logic of the proof and uh, a little insight and I'll conclude. So first of all, by the single commodity necessity theory theorem, we know that the subnetwork for each commodity must be series parallel. So we apply the single commodity theorem. If diversity always helps, we must have a series parallel network for a single commodity. So for every commodity, we have a series parallel network, but those may overlap in many different ways. And to show that they overlap in exactly the block matching way that I described, we need to show that if, we, if I take any two commodities and any two blocks in those commodities, either those two blocks entirely coincide or they have no common edges. And this part now, to prove that, I use a proof by contradiction. So suppose not. Suppose I find two commodities and two blocks so that they share an edge, but they do not entirely coincide. So one has an edge that the other one doesn't have. I'll get a contradiction by a careful construction embedding that previous example that I showed. 
<laughs> and that's uh, that looks quite messy on the figure, and the proof itself is quite messy. So just to try to convey a, a, a very brief flavor, we show that if a path for the second commodity must use an edge from this first commodity B, this edge cannot be an internal edge. It must be that if they share any common edges, that green path must enter block B from its beginning and exit it from the end. And it will mean that the entire block B must be used by the second commodity also, therefore contradicting that B has one more edge that this other block doesn't have. And to show that the contradiction that this common edge cannot be internal, it must be from the beginning, if it is internal, we basically are able to construct careful, with carefully chosen delay and deviation functions um, a way to guide the flow so that the flow goes exactly in the way that it went in this simple case. And uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll not go into any more details, no, not to confuse you, but, but basically with a very careful construction, we, uh, we show an example where if the edge is internal, diversity hurts therefore obtaining the desired contradiction. And so I'll just, there is a lot of related work and I'll defer it to the papers, but I'll just conclude again stating the main results that diversity helps if and only if the network is series parallel for a single commodity and correspondingly if and only if it is block matched for multiple uh, commodities. And I'll conclude, thanks. Thank you. So is the Bay Area Road Network block matched for? <laughs> is, the Bay Area, is the Bay Area Road Network block matched? I, I haven't uh, stared at it enough to see. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. In one of your earlier talks, you cited an example where drivers might be risk seeking. For example, if the mean travel time won't get you to your flight on time, but if you get lucky on a, on a road with high variance, you might do so. So does it make sense to increase your diversity in this model by including risk-seeking as well as risk-averse drivers? So when I said that, um, that was more of a play on the words. It was, uh, I said that when users are risk-averse, they actually may prefer a gamble if this is the only thing that gets them uh, a, non neg no, a positive probability of arriving on time. So it was actually, a, in this guise, a risk-averse model again. But you, sure, you may come up maybe with an example where users uh, select risk-seeking routes instead. Um, and then, I, I guess I, I haven't thought about it. So yeah, I have a hard time mapping it now to these results. But, yeah. What is the source of the uncertainty? And why does it depend on x? So again, this goes to things that are a little bit outside this model. So here, I w this talk really was not about uncertainty at all. It was just about trading off two criteria. But if you took the motivation for risk aversion as providing two criteria, such as mean and variance, um, Anything really, both exogenous and endogenous. Is that what you had in mind? So yes. traffic accidents, weather, anything that, that might cause. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much.